Willful Virgin, Essays in Feminism by Marilyn Fry, Part 1, Lesbian Feminist in the Academy, Essay Number 4, A Lesbian's Perspective on Women's Studies, 1980. Looking at women's studies from my lesbian perspective and with my lesbian feminist sensibility, what I see is that women's studies is heterosexual. The predominance of heterosexual perspectives, values, commitments, thought and vision is usually so complete and ubiquitous that it cannot be perceived for lack of contrast. Like the air on a calm and moderate day, the way sexism still is for many people. Sometimes, usually because of the interruption and contrast imported by my own presence, the basically and pervasively heterosexual character of women's studies is very clear and perceptible, overwhelmingly and deeply disappointing. It is also, usually, unspoken and unspeakable. Some of my colleagues in women's studies say they cannot really tell the truth or quote-unquote be radical in their teaching because it would alienate the students. I tell them not to worry about alienating people. I say that the truth is challenging, interesting, compelling, and very effective in the classroom. I also say that when one attempts just to tell the truth, the responses, whether constructive or hostile, honest or dishonest, will be the best clues to one's errors. But in my dealings with my heterosexual women's studies colleagues, I do not take my own advice. I have routinely and habitually muffled or stifled myself on the subject of lesbianism and heterosexualism, feminism and women's studies, out of some sort of concern about alienating them. Some of these women are tangibly peculiar about lesbianism and are already offended by my being uncloseted and blatant. I do not think they have noticed that I avoid discussing lesbianism and heterosexuality with them for fear their already nervous association with women's studies would become simply untenable for them. Much more important to me is a smaller number who are my dependable political co-workers in the university. The ones in the ac academic world with the clearest and strongest feminist and anti-racist politics. The ones with some commitment to not being homophobic and to trying to be comprehending and supportive of lesbians and lesbianism. If I estrange these women, I will lose the only footing I have politically and personally in my long-term workaday survival in academia. They are important, valuable, and respected allies. I am very careful, over-careful, when I talk about heterosexuality with them. But the situation is asymmetrical, as it always is with minority or marginal people and majority or dominant people. What is a topic for them, which, can, which some can and some cannot attend fruito, fruitfully, is a condition of life for me. I avoid quote-unquote alienating them, but they constantly, and usually unconsciously, alienate me by their mostly uncritical and apparently unalterable, to me unfathomable, commitment to heterosexuality, by which I mean deeply bound emotional and intellectual commitments to men, to reform, to integration, and to the centrality and neutral necessity of heterosexual genital sex. The unwelcome weight of this heterosexualism is a salient fact of my life, and its manifestations in the politics of women's studies are coming very clear to me and should be stated. In my experience with women's studies, it seems common and characteristic for the women instructors to assume the widespread heterosexuality and the dominance of heterosexual conception, conceptions they have always been and will always be the way it is for humans on this planet, in particular for women on this planet. Lesbianism is seen by most of them, but not all, as an acceptable, plausible alternative for some women and is understood, not by all, at least at a verbal level, to be clearly coherent with feminism. But they all believe that it is only realistic to understand that most women are, and most women will be, heterosexual, at least for the duration of an era that our practical politics can concern itself with. Women's studies programming is grounded on the assumption that the vast majority of the students are and always will be heterosexual. Hence, we give them almost entirely heterosexual women's literature, the history of heterosexual women, and analysis of the roles of heterosexual women in work, business, the arts, and heterosexual domestic life.
It is also assumed that we should support, not just tolerate, speakers, films, workshops, classes, whole courses which encourage women to prepare themselves to cope with life in the quote-unquote dual career marriage, teach how to be married and a feminist, and train them in the tricks of legislative reform so they can try to ensure that abortions will be available to them when they need them, since they obviously will not practice the only safe and sure method of contraception. We presume the students are hopelessly heterosexual and cater to their interests and needs we assume heterosexual women to have. Instead of assuming, they're educable to other ways of living, different needs and interests, and some non- or anti-heterosexist sensibility and politics. Women's studies, as an institution, as I know it, actively and aggressively supports women in becoming and remaining heterosexual. It actively seeks to encourage women to believe that the personal, political, economic, and health problems associated with heterosexuality for women should be struggled with rather than avoided. That these problems are inevitable, but more or less solvable, with great endurance and much work, rather than that they are unsolvable, but definitely evitable. I am notorious in my own recruitment of women to lesbianism and lesbian perspectives. But what I do is minuscule. Imagine a real reversal of the heterosexualist teaching our program provides. Imagine 30 faculty members at a large university engaged routinely and seriously in the vigorous and aggressive encouragement of women to be lesbians, helping them learn skills and ideas for living as lesbians teaching the connection between lesbianism and feminism and between heterosexism and sexism, building understanding of the agency of individual men in keeping individual women in line for the patriarchy. Imagine us openly and actively advising women not to marry, not to fuck, not to become bonded with any man. Imagine us teaching lots of lesbian literature, poetry, history, and art in women's studies courses, and teaching out a politics determined by lesbian perception and sensibility. Imagine all this going on as actively and openly and enthusiastically as the program now promotes the searching out of careers and quote-unquote feminist men, the development of quote-unquote egalitarian marriages, and the management of heterosexual sex and the family. But the politics which women's studies purveys, even when some material by or about other lesbians is included in some courses, it he is heterosexual politics. And according to heterosexual politics, lesbianism could never be the norm, and promoting lesbianism for women generally is somewhere between unrealistic and abusive. The people who are the primary agents in determining and promoting this politics in women's studies are the heterosexual feminists in academia. These women are, not without exception, quite good in their relations with the few lesbians they work with, supportive, tolerant, useful. But this friendly, open-minded, even appreciative attitude camouflages their continuing and firm commitment to our marginality. Their being friendly and supportive and respectful to a few lesbians, who inevitably serve as tokens, has obscured from me and from them the enduring fact that they never take seriously any idea that lesbians or lesbianism should not be marginal. I want to ask heterosexual academic feminists to do some hard analytical and reflective work. To begin, I want to say to them, I wish you would notice that you are heterosexual. I wish you would grow to the understanding that you choose heterosexuality. I would like to rise each morning and know, sorry, I would like you to rise each morning and know that you are heterosexual and that you choose to be heterosexual, that you are and choose to be a member of a privileged and dominant class, one of your own privileges being not to notice. <clears throat> I wish you would stop and seriously consider as a broad and long-term feminist political strategy, the conversion of women to a woman-identified and woman-directed sexuality and eroticism as a way of breaking the grip of men on women's minds and women's bodies, of removing women from the chronic attachment to the primary situations of sexual and physical violence that is reigned upon women by men and as a way of promoting women's firm and reliable bonding against oppression.
Some heterosexual women have said in response to these sorts of sayings, quote, I see the connection between lesbianism and feminism, but I cannot just decide to be a lesbian. I am not sexually attracted to women. Women just don't turn me on, end quote. And I want to ask, quote, why not? Why don't women turn you on? Why aren't you attracted to women, end quote. I do not mean these questions rhetorically. I am completely serious. The suppression of lesbian feeling, sensibility, and response has been so thorough and so brutal for such a long time that if there were not a strong and widespread inclination to lesbianism, it would have been erased from human life. There is so much pressure on women to be heterosexual, and this pressure is both so pervasive and so completely denied that I think heterosexuality cannot come naturally to many women. I think that widespread heterosexuality among women is a highly artificial product of the patriarchy. I suspect that it is not true at all that we must assume that most women are and most women will forever be heterosexual. I think most women have to be coerced into heterosexuality. I would like heterosexual women to consider this proposition seriously. I want heterosexual women to do intense and serious consciousness raising and exploration of their own personal histories and to find out how and when, in their own development, the separation of women from the erotic came about for them. I would like heterosexual women to be as actively curious about how and why and when they became heterosexual as I have been about how and why and when I became lesbian. At this point, it might seem that I am demanding a heterosexual woman a respect for my choice, but that I am unwilling to respect theirs. I think, though, that it is respectful of autonomy to genuinely inquire into the history and grounds of choices, and respectful or negligent of autonomy to let unfreedom masquerade as choice, or let the declaration, quote-unquote, it's my choice, close off rather than open up inquiry. Millions of heterosexual women give no thought to what heterosexuality is or why they are heterosexual. Heterosexuality is understood by them to be sexuality, and they assume uncritically and unthinkingly that it is simply the way humans are. They do not perceive heterosexuality as an option. Where there are no perceived options, there can be no such thing as choice, and hence, one cannot respect the choice. But well-educated, worldly, politically astute, thoughtful, analytical feminist women do know perfectly well that there are options, and that lesbian life is an option that coheres very well with feminist politics. They do choose to be heterosexual. Respect for that choice, on my part and on their part, demands that they make that choice intelligible. Many feminist lesbians have thought and reflected and written and worked very hard to demonstrate that our choice makes sense. We have gone forth and participated on panels and in workshops and appeared on television explaining ourselves. We have, over and over, at great personal risk and considerable cost, worked as hard as we know how to make our choice intelligible to audiences ranging from the idle curious to the skeptical to the openly hostile. Respect for heterosexuals' choice demands equally that they show, within the gentle standards of rationality recommended by womanly sensibility, that their, their choice can be understood as a reasonable choice. Until this has been shown, I will not grant the assumption that heterosexuality can make sense for feminists, and I am not willing to continue uncritical acceptance of women's studies programs promoting heterosexuality for women. Unless many heterosexual feminists start working as hard at making their choice intelligible to lesbians have worked, sorry, as lesbians have worked at making ours intelligible, they should refrain from teaching and publishing and other works which openly or implicitly encourage other women in becoming or remaining committed to heterosexuality. And lesbians should refrain from supporting women's studies. Nineteen ninety two postscript. I gave this transcript, sorry, the transcript of this talk to my heterosexual women friends in women's studies at my home institution, and they discussed it amongst themselves. The reports that came back to me indicated to me that they were, understandably, discomfited by this anger, by the anger in this talk, and tended to respond somewhat defensively. 
but apparently it did sim stimulate some of them to discuss their sexuality together in different ways than they had before. Apparently, they thought there was a contradiction in my argument where I was simultaneously saying their heterosexuality was a choice and that there was a history of their becoming heterosexual, a history of the separation of women from the erotic of them, and that there is great pressure on women to be heterosexual. That does not seem like a contradiction to me. I did not mean that one can choose all of a sudden and for doctrinal reasons to be aroused by different things than what has aroused one up to now. But one can choose environments to place oneself in. One can choose literature to read and art to engage with. One can choose to think critically about things one has not thought critically about before. And one can choose, also, how one presents oneself in the world. As canny consumers, we choose, for instance, to mute the TV when ads come on, to read more and watch more TV less, to engage more with people who resist consumerism and less with people who are into it. And as persons concerned to take care intelligently of our health, we wean ourselves from foods we are more or less addicted to and regularly crave by exposing ourselves to selected information and images, engaging more with others who model good eating and less with others who model poor eating. By willfully changing some of our behaviors so it is out of line with the desires we want to unlearn and in line with the desires we want to learn. In time, we actually do alter our desires, wishes, needs, patterns of excitement, and so on. It may be that it would not be wise for a heterosexual woman to engage in retaining her erotic desires. It may be that it would be wise. But the fact that those desires have a history, and that history includes coercive pressures, does not mean she does not have many choices to make with respect to those desires. At the time I was composing this talk, I thought that many of the heterosexual women I encountered in women's studies had chosen to view those desires as natural, given, inborn, immutable, and had chosen to live them out to a great extent in accord with the patterns of female heterosexuality as it is institutionalized in contemporary patriarchy. The practical question that this speech gives rise to is that of whether this angry lesbian continued to engage in women's studies. She did, and she still does. I have, after all, not been willing to hand women's studies over to heterosexualism. In spite of everything, lesbianism and lesbian meeting can be sheltered and nurtured in women's studies programs, and the influence of lesbians on women's studies has been significant and salutary. Politically, women's studies is a far more suitable home in the academy than in the newly developing and euphemistically named quote-unquote lesbian and gay studies, where lesbians have to struggle almost from scratch for feminist analysis and feminist perspectives, as well as gaining the sexist perceptions and behaviors of them, sorry, of the men involved. Tension and anger between lesbian and non-lesbian feminists in the academy still exists and still surfaces from time to time. A very basic question about sexuality and feminist politics are still utterly and painfully unresolved. My own most recent effort to come to gripes with some of it is in Willful Virgin or Do You Have to Be a Lesbian to Be a Feminist in this anthology. That's the last essay of the book. 